Hello, Jess. Thank you so much for joining me on the Black Fundraisers podcast. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Kia? Thank you for having me. Of course. Terrific. Terrific. So glad you could join. This is a really, really critical subject we're talking about here, which is sustainer donors. And we're going to get into that in just a moment. But I'd love for you to tell the good people listening First and foremost, a fun and little known fact about yourself and a little about your firm. Of course, yeah. Ooh, a little known fact about me. And I was thinking about this. I guess I could answer so many different ways, but uh, you know, people will ask, you know, if you weren't doing fundraising, if you weren't in the fundraising world, what would I do? And I think for me, I always want to be a travel writer. I don't know what I would travel. I mean, I know where I would travel to. And I think you know, more recently, the last few years, I've really gotten into hiking. So I live on the West Coast in Vancouver, Canada. We have three local mountains, so I tend to get out and do a few hikes in the spring and summer. So if you know money wasn't an issue and maybe when I retire, I would love to travel around the world, go on hikes, unique hikes, and, uh, and blog about it and write about it. And I you know there's immense privilege in that. So I acknowledge that. And that's something I would... You know, I I would love to do. So I would say that's probably sort of a, a little known fact about me. And for about, and my agency, I'm still new. So a, a name and a website is soon to come. Uh, but uh, I've been in fundraising for about 15 years, uh, focusing on individual giving with a big focus on monthly giving or recurring giving. And after spending 10 years at a children's hospital here in Vancouver, overseeing their monthly giving program, which when I left was raising over $5 million a year from close to 20,000 monthly donors. I decided to go out on my own and uh, be a fundraising consultant. And I focus on monthly giving, donor journey mapping, fundraising analytics, and individual giving in general. And uh, I love working with small, medium, and large charities. I My background is in consulting. So I'm glad to be back in the fundraising space or the fundraising consulting space where I can work with uh, different charities from across Canada and the U.S. So this is good stuff, Jazz. And as I mentioned a moment ago, this episode is all about sustainer donors, a.k.a. monthly donors, recurring donors. And why organizations should prioritize them? Do you want to take a moment and talk about that? Yeah, of course. So with uh, the standard and monthly donors, the reason you want to prioritize them is actually yeah, quite a few reasons. One of the biggest reasons is for uh, legacy and prospect giving. So monthly donors tend to be ideal prospects for a charity to approach for a gift in their will or a plan gift or also referred to a legacy gift. In my experience, both at the children's hospital I worked at as well as a few other charities in my uh, consulting past, uh, you could have, you know, anywhere from 5 to 10%, some higher, some lower of your monthly donors going on to leave a legacy gift to your charity. And, you know, legacy gifts can range anywhere from 30000 to 300000 to, who knows, $30 million. Right? So I think when charities are looking at investing in monthly giving, they need to look at the long-term picture. It's not only how much are these monthly donors going to give during their lifetime as monthly donors, but what is the potential five, 10, 15, 20 years down the road when um, the legacy gets to be realized? Absolutely. So Jazz, you've had the opportunity to work in, you shared the hospital environment. And I imagine as a consultant, um, you've probably set your sights on some organizations that have done sustainer programs particularly well. I'd love for you to cite a couple of examples of sustainer programs done right. And I'd also like to know, by your estimation, is having a thriving sustainer program really tenable for some of those smaller organizations? To answer the first question, I, there's quite a few, especially, you know, in Europe and Canada. So for a bit of background, monthly giving or sustainer giving started in Europe long before I came to North America. 
So a lot of the organizations have been doing a fantastic job with sustainable giving in Europe. Uh, and then they moved to Canada. And I think US is a little far behind in uh, adopting sustainable giving. It's made a huge uh, stride in the last couple of years. In terms of uh, charities that I want to kind of model my work after or kind of aim for, in Canada, you know, a lot of the charities in the international development space are doing a fantastic job of sustainable giving, whether it's Plan International Canada, Amnesty International, the two that come to mind. In terms of another charity would be Sick Kids in Toronto. They have invested a lot of time and effort into their sustainable program, and they do a really great job of uh, sustainable giving through a multi-channel approach. You know, they do TV, radio, digital, mail, email, phone, every channel imaginable, they do it and they invest in it. And uh, so I think those are the three in Canada that can I think that can think of as the great monthly giving programs. Uh, along with, you know, to along with BC Children's, the children's hospital that I worked at, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I'm very proud of the work that uh, the team at Children's Hospital in Vancouver did to grow the monthly giving program to where it is right now, one of the strongest ones um, in Canada when it comes to hospitals. Two, two, two. You know, I'm a big fan of women doting on their achievements, their accomplishments, and their successes, especially women of color. Because if we don't, you're not likely to be noticed. You know, nobody's really checking for us and what we do. So if we don't talk about it, nobody's going to know how dope we are. And that's the way I see it. So two, two, Jazz Judy. <laughs> Thank you, Kia. I love that. And I, and you're so right. I think we, we're the ones we have to watch out for ourselves. And if we do something well, let's tell the world and tell each other and uh, prop ourselves up, but also prop each other up. Absolutely. We don't have to be in the humble brag. I'm as humble as they come. But when it comes to this work, I'm, I'm gonna brag a little bit about it because what's happening in our communities is not nice. It's not nice. And there's a lot of other ways that I could describe it, you know, and use some epithets in there. It's not nice. And it's hard work that we're doing. It takes grit. So toot, 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 Jazz Judy. <laughs> Thank you, Kia. And especially when you think about, you know, I know it's in Canada and I imagine the U.S. as well. A lot of the charities are led by women, you know, predominantly most of the staff of all the charities that I worked with are women. So really it's women and, you know, women from all parts of the world, especially women of color, we're keeping the uh, charitable sector alive. So I think, yeah, so to, to, to you as well and all of the amazing women that keep our sector going and flourishing. So those are some great exemplars that you've lifted up. I'm going to do a good old Google search to see what they got going on. I want to know, for organizations that are smaller, some that will seek you out, that are a little intimidated, maybe, when they see the thriving hospitals and other organizations doing all of these, offering premiums by design of their sustainer programs, and, you know, they might not be as resource-rich, is a robust offering within their sustainer program really tenable? 100%, you know. So I'm going to, you know, uh, take it back a little bit and think, you know, when you're thinking about launching a monthly giving, sustainable giving program, keep it simple. I think we tend to think, you know, model, smaller charities might model themselves with looking after the sick kids of the world or charity water or, you know, Red Cross, who all have great sustainable programs, but you have to start small. So what I always say is, if you have a group of donors, a group of engaged folks that have given to your cause, whether it's 100 people, 100,000 people, you can do sustainable giving. What The way you do it is, you, oh, I always call it start by fishing in your own pond. Take a look at how many donors do you have? How many have given more than once? How many have given year after year, or how many people have increased their giving? 
those are the folks that you want to have a conversation with about sustainable giving. Uh, do you have folks who are donors who have a connection with your cause? So if you're a hospital, are they patients? If you're an arts organization, are they patrons of your organization? Is finding those real connections um, based on who they are, how long they've been giving, how much they've given, and really, if, you know, to really focus on monthly giving, you want to focus on people who have given recently, people who have given often, and people who have given uh, year over year and have increased their giving. And those are the patterns any charity can look at, uh, including smaller ones. And really the benefit of being a smaller charity is you, if you have a smaller monthly giving program, you can really offer a curated program for them. You can really offer that one-on-one -on -one approach that a lot of smaller, or sorry, a lot of bigger charities can't because bigger charities, if you have 20,000 uh, sustainer donors, chances are you need to automate a lot of those uh, stewardship and solicitation efforts. Whereas if you're a smaller charity, you have 100 monthly donors, well, you can pick up the phone and attempt to talk to those 100 monthly donors at least once a year, because that's doable. So I always say it's definitely tenable, start small and don't think of, you know, modeling yourself off of the bigger charity. Just think of what you can do that's unique to you and start small. I absolutely love that. And I know that somebody listening is encouraged by that. The fact that you can start where you are, the fact that you can look at your donor's behavior. And we know about segmentation. If you have donors that are giving recurring gifts, um, lookalikes, you know, I have in a moment, mm -hmm. if you'd be so kind, we'll talk a little bit about those lookalike donors that haven't necessarily opted in to a donor program, but they behave like that. You know, our donors give us clues and by design of their behavior, right? But I love the fact that you were saying to the good people listening, look, you don't have to be a multi-million dollar hospital that's got this endowment. You got a few folks that know and love you. Rock out in that space and harness the fact that you're small but mighty to make those personal touches that will resonate strongly with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, one of the things, uh, and this one I'm going to uh, uh, mention another amazing woman named Erica Wasdorp, who is uh, another consultant, and she is one of the pioneers who's really been having the monthly giving uh, or been beating the monthly giving drum for many years. And I think she should get a lot of credit for really bringing it to the forefront of a lot of charities across the U.S. So one of the things she always says is, you know, what I said earlier, keep it simple, but also how about dedicating a day, monthly giving Monday or recurring giving Monday. And every Monday, spend a couple hours or it doesn't have to be Monday, could be a Tuesday, a Thursday or Friday, where you spend a couple of hours just looking, focusing on, on monthly giving. And for, you know, those the folks who are listening and they might have a small database and maybe it's all sitting in spreadsheets. Well, guess what? You know, open up your spreadsheet of your data, play around with it, look at who your donors are in the last six months of giving, a year of giving, two, three, four, five years. Look at five years of data and see what patterns are emerging. How many people are giving more than once? How many people have upgraded their giving? And those are the folks that you can then uh, sit down and develop a strategy with. And it can be as simple as sending a postcard, just thanking them for their support and then following up with a postcard with a phone call. I think that it can be as simple as that, dedicating some time each week to your recurring giving efforts and starting by looking at your data of your existing donors. I love this. So for an organization that's considering launching a sustainer donor, you've given us a couple of things to be thinking about, but I'd love for you to give them a few notes to jot down or a little guidance as they get these wheels turning, like a moment ago, you said, you know, look at your donor's behavior, who's giving on a recurring basis, who's give, who's upgraded in terms of their giving, right? Mm -hmm. What are yeah. some, what are some other indicators or impronitors that 
fundraisers should be thinking about, the good people listening out there? So uh, the few you can think of, uh, one is if they've given their first ever gift to you recently. Ideally, the best time to ask someone to give a monthly gift is someone who's given in the last six months, their first ever gift to you in the last six months, because something motivated them about your work or excited them about your work for them to make a donation, whether it was to a fundraising ask or unsolicited or at an event that, you know, and especially if you, if the experience of making that one-time donation with your cause was a positive one, they were, they felt good but making a donation because they, you know, the, your stewardship was great, you reached out to them to thank them. That's an oppor great opportunity to have the monthly giving conversation. So yeah, someone who's given in the last six months, someone, as I said, who's given year after year, you know, someone's given two years in a row, three years in a row, those are good folks. Maybe someone who started giving, let's say $20 a year has gone on to 40, 50, maybe someone who gave $100 a year has gone on to 120. You know, it doesn't matter what they started with, it's that they've increasing it. Uh, so yeah, so those are the two things. And as I also said, is it somebody who has not only given to you, but has engaged with you in other ways? Do they follow you on social media? Uh, have they attended any of your events? Uh, so where they're, they're, they're interacting with you in more than one way. So those are the three that I can think of at the top of my uh, head is, it's longevity of giving, upgrading, and re have recently given their first ever gift to you and are connected to your cause in some way. Either they benefited from the work that you do or someone they know has benefited from the work they do. They, they might be a volunteer and a donor. That's another indication that uh, they're committed. Yes. And I think, yeah, and I think often charities, we don't think, tend to think of volunteers as donors. You know, I think you know, sometimes we get into the thinking of, oh, they're already giving their time why would we want to ask them for money? Well, I think that's not our decision to make. Have that conversation with your volunteers if they're open to becoming a monthly donor. I agree 100%, Jazz. One of the questions that I received in an email from one of the good people listening that I want to share with you is, is there a particular threshold a uh, gift threshold that a fundraiser should consider for a monthly donors. Like some people seem to be under the impression that your monthly donors are just those folks that are given $10, $20, $7. I was, I'll never forget, I think my uh, previous employers average gift was something like between 25 and 37 dollars so those lower um, more regular threshold gifts but i've had recurring donors that were given as much as 500 dollars a month yes i think there's really no tried and tested way to say that you know you must cut off uh, asking your donors um, for a monthly gift if they give a thousand or more or five hundred or more because you don't know you we can't know the donors well enough to make that decision for them. You can do some testing. So you could start off by saying, you know, I'm starting my monthly giving efforts and we're going to start the low hanging fruit. Maybe it's the folks that are giving a hundred dollars a year and they've been giving for two three years. We'll ask those folks. Maybe you might have someone who's giving a thousand dollars a year. Maybe those are the folks you have a conversation with later on i think you just have to do the testing based on my experience uh at bc children's we cut off the threshold at a thousand a year not because we didn't think that these folks would not be wanting to be a monthly donor so they did not go into our telephone raising program or, or any of our email campaigns but it's because they had a, a, a somebody a staff member assigned to those donors anybody giving between a thousand and ten thousand so they were already getting that elevated level of stewardship and that person would have that conversation about monthly giving with them so they didn't go into like the mass marketing program but they were still having that conversation so i would say test it uh you could have somebody who's giving a thousand dollars a year but they might also be giving you twenty dollars a month in addition so really there's really no cutoff, uh, especially for a smaller charity, it's just having a conversation. Agreed. 
So I have one final question for you, Jazz. And this is something that I observed and have lived experience myself with as a major gifts fundraiser. And it was something that I'd not seen before, quite honestly, and had to give some thought to, you know, what's the strategy here? Uh, how do I want to interface with this particular type of donor. And these are those lookalike donors. These are those donors who have not necessarily officially opted into the sustainer program. Maybe they don't want to receive the mailings that you know, they believe come with that, right? Or they're a person that has asked to be opted out of emails, et cetera. Um, I've seen that too in this case, but it's been my lived experience that these particular look-alike donors were not interested in opting into the sustainer program, despite having been asked, and they were completely unresponsive to direct mail. However, by design of their donor behavior, by design of their affinity, right? They, interestingly enough, elected to make a monthly recurring gift on their own, whether they did it through bill pay, through their bank or whatever, right? I'd love to hear from you. What's your experience with those lookalike donors and what guidance would you offer a gift officer in their stewardship of those lookalikes? I think in that example, so it's, let's say it's a group of donors or a donor who says, you know, you know, who, who has been getting mail and ma emails and hasn't responded to them, but at some point they go online to make a donation. I think we have to kind of take a step back and say, someone going online to make a donation, is that's a method of payment, right? Chances are the conversations you had with them through email, over the phone, through the mail, it really was, it was a combination of everything, you know, hopefully the emails you were sending and the mailings you were sending, the phone calls you were having, having you were sharing your charity's cause and the impact of, uh, of that donor support. So storytelling is key in fundraising. So chances are the story about your cause that you were able to tell through all of those channels that you, that you engage the donor with, whether or not they responded to any of those channels, they still played a role that compelled them to go online to make a donation. You know, folks, donors will always, some donors will say, don't send me mailings. You know, I don't need to uh, get multiple mailings. I'll just respond through email and that's okay. And you need to honor those donors' wishes. But when it comes to any form of fundraising, using more than one channel is key because the way you tell a story in a mailing is different than the way you tell a story in an email, the way you tell a story in a video. They're all great in their own way, but they're different forms of storytelling. And I think I would say, even though those particular donors went along to make a donation, they didn't just all of a sudden decide to make a donation. There was something in there, in the way they engaged with your cause that made them want to make that donation. So I would say this is... No question. And I'm going to be honest with you. I was more deliberate about honoring their desire in terms of how the how this particular donor and it happened more than a couple of times I wanted to honor their request and respect their wishes and not just push them into an orientation of sustainer mailings because they didn't want to receive that and allow them to give via that preferred channel, right? But nonetheless, what I did is, you know, I reached out um, because they were giving at the level of what would be more a mid-level donor gift. And I wanted them to get that customer service, that upgraded experience. And I felt like just that opportunity to steward them and honor their wishes and keep them content and feeling the love was more important than just being so perfunctory about it and pushing them into an, an orientation of a sustainer donor when they really didn't want to be. 
100%. And I think you did what every fundraiser should do is when a donor says, you know, I don't want to be part of the program or take me off your emails, take me off your mailings. If, if a donor cares enough to contact a charity to say that, you need to honor that because the donor knows best what, how they want to be engaged. And I think what you yeah. did there, you took the extra step. You could have just removed them from the, from the, the program, but you call them to kind of ask, you know, get to know them a little bit. And I, I, I bet it was that conversation, that one-on-one -on -one stewardship that helped them make that decision of becoming a sustainer donor. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And it wasn't even a hard conversation. I remember once having a conversation like, you know, we received this generous gift from you. Thought, whoa, that was awfully generous. I sent you an acknowledgement, but then I saw it again and wanted to reach out to you, you know, just to verify that you'd intended to do this because I have had donors who did not intend to set up a gift on a recurring basis. And it rolled into a conversation of, well, yeah, I did it that way. I prefer to do it that way. It works for me. It's mm -hmm. easy. And, you know, of course, I showered gratitude on them. And it just provided an entree to a really authentic and meaningful conversation. And again, this was one of those opportunities where I personally had to notate that donor record and notate their preferences and make sure the sustainer gift officer, the donor experience person, you know, wasn't kind of, it, we make sure that we were on the same page um, in terms of, you know, how to steward this donor, meaning, okay, this is kind of a hands-off for your department, right? And that was it. And this person was in more, was then in a mid-level pipeline, a mid-level pool, right? And treated as such. And that worked out perfectly. A hundred percent. I think this is where that's, you know, that stewardship one-on-one -on -one is listening to your donors. And I think if you have a sustainable program, you have to Think of it, the donors as, you know, they're not a group that are there, you know, they're, they're still individual folks that some of them will, you know, some of them will just give, maybe they'll give $20 a month for a year or longer, or they'll do it for a very long time. And they're fine with sort of being part of the sustainable program and getting the sort of stewardship and being asked to upgrade it. But then there are donors who, who want engagement slightly differently. You know, I'll give you an example of one donor that I worked with in my past where this donor has signed up as a monthly donor to a door-to-door -door program, so door-to-door -door canvassing program. And, you know, when we called him um, a year later to see if he wanted to upgrade his gift, he said yes. He upgraded his gift every single time we asked him. And uh, at some point during a phone call, he expressed an interest in wanting to learn a bit more about how does he make a bigger contribution after giving monthly gifts for a few years and upgrading that monthly gift each time, he then went on to make a, a, a commitment of half a million dollars. So really it's because we listened to that donor and we had that, yeah, it's just listening to those donors and not treating them as a one big group, just knowing that it's made up of individual folks that might have individual preferences. And that's where a smaller charity that has you know, a smaller pool of monthly donors, whether it's 50 or 100, you can have the opportunity to have those conversations with those donors. Call them once or twice a year to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation the way you would with a mid-level or major gift donor. Exactly. You heard it first, folks, good people listening. Leverage that seat. This is one of those, one of those many areas where small and mighty wins because no one wants to feel like a number on a piece of paper. You know, um, no one wants to just be, have their communication preferences dishonored. At the end of the day, I'm a firm believer that people want to contribute to something greater than self. They want to make a social impact on some level 
And it takes us doing the work that we're doing to partner with them to help them achieve that. And it should not be arduous. It should not be contentious. It should be a great experience for them by and by because they don't have to support us. You know, they can pick and choose where they want to bestow, you know, the fruits of their labor. So I'm a firm proponent of um, just very thoughtful stewardship. So I thank you for that, Jazz. Yeah. And I would echo, you know, what you said, Kia, how smaller charities have, they're actually, that's a big benefit for being a smaller charity and having a smaller pool of monthly donors. You have the opportunity to steward them. You know, as I said earlier, set aside an hour every week where put it in your calendar. You're not going to have any meetings. Let your folks know this is my hour to focus on recurring donors. That's an opportunity where you call your existing recurring donors to thank them. You call folks maybe who aren't recurring donors but are prospects for it. Call them or send them a postcard, handwritten note, an email, really focusing on, you know, even if you could do a couple hours a week, maybe one hour is for acquisition and the other hours for retention staff stewardship. So two hours out of you know your week to focus on recurring giving. And I promise you, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, your charity will raise significantly more funds through recurring giving and in 10, 20 years through legacy giving. And chances are those legacy gifts won't be realized in your time with the charity, but they will be. And your cause will be immensely helped by those substantial gifts that come out from those folks that are giving 10, 20, $15 a month. No, this is good stuff, good people. Get your notes, play it back, run it back. Because she's giving you some yeah. jewels of wisdom. Well, Jazz, I want to thank you for coming on the Black Fundraisers podcast. We're going to have Jazz back on the Black Fundraisers podcast. And we're going to be doing some other cool things with Jazz via Fundraising in Black, which is a fundraising capacity building initiative for black led organizations and even brown led my brown brothers and sisters y'all are welcome and encouraged uh, so we will definitely have you back miss jazz judy i just love this name oh thank you you know what though i like that jazz judy kia crew we kind of have like a little yes. same yeah we might have to do a podcast shoot a, a sustainer podcast or something i don't know I think so. I like that. Yeah. I mean, I can talk about sustain. I can talk about sustainable giving all day. So this has been such a pleasure. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing more of this with you and uh, the good folks listening. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, my name should be easy to find. There is a Jazz Judy who's a man, so that's not me. But uh, you should be able to find me. <laughs> J A S J H O O T Y Jazz Judy. She's the bomb.com. Well, thank you, Jazz, and good people listening. I hope you enjoyed this segment. Stay tuned for what we've got in store next week. Tell me how you're feeling, how you thinking, how you living. Are you enjoying the video podcast, the cocktail conversations? Drop me a note, drop me a line, and let me know. And don't forget to follow the Black Fundraisers podcast LinkedIn page to keep up with all the great content and resources we're sharing with you. So until next time, good people, stay tuned, stay down, and keep your head up. You know the deal. <laughs>